The Cricket World Cup has shrunk over the years, while the FIFA World Cup continues expanding. In 2007, 16 nations competed in the Cricket World Cup. Yet in the most recent 2023 tournament, only 10 teams participated, six fewer than 2007. Compare this to the growth of the FIFA World Cup. 32 countries played in 2006, while 48 are slated to compete in 2026, a rise of 16 additional teams. So why is cricket shrinking? Is India the reason? Let find out. Cricket is deeply loved in India, a religion for many. Indian viewers comprise 90% of the sport's global audience. This popularity has allowed the BCCI to become a multi-billion dollar body, making it the wealthiest organization in cricket worldwide. The successful Indian Premier League, IPL, underpins BCCI's financial success. IPL matches are hugely valuable. Using its monetary influence, BCCI now seeks greater control in cricket. However, 30 years ago, BCCI did not have funds to reward India's World Cup winners. At that time, India had one of cricket's weakest teams while England governed the sport. One pivotal event changed cricket's power balance. Administration moved from England to India. But rather than promote cricket globally, India prioritised profitability. So while cricket passion is sky-high in India, their revenue focus has stifled the game's growth beyond the Commonwealth. India capitalised on cricket as a money-making vehicle instead of broadening participation worldwide. It's the 1983 World Cup Finals Day at Cricket's Mecca, Lords. The underdog Indians face the dominant West Indies team, two-time defending champions. India was considered one of the weakest teams in cricket. They had won just one match in the previous two World Cups. Bookmakers gave India 66 to 1 odds to beat the mighty West Indies in their opening game. But India stunningly won and then topped their group, even beating hosts England to reach the finals, shocking the cricketing world. Tickets were scarce for the historic finals featuring the upstart Indians. Two days prior, BCCOI President NKP Salve received a request from an Indian minister for two tickets. But the English organisers rejected Salve's plea for extra tickets. This insult epitomised England's command over cricket as the founders. They wrote the rules, controlled the World Cup hosting and spread the game in colonies. Cricket was seen as England's property. Salvi hoped if India somehow won, they could host the next World Cup and loosen England's grip on the sport. But could India actually beat the dominant West Indies? Before the tournament, a leading voice predicted India should withdraw as unworthy. If India won, he famously vowed to eat his words. Remarkably, on June 25th at Lords, India defeated West Indies to lift the trophy. Making history, India won the World Cup as severe underdogs. The expert ate his printed words, and cricket's power balance began tilting from England toward India. India's historic 1983 World Cup win gave NKP Salve confidence to challenge England's cricket dominance. He allied with Pakistan and Sri Lanka to form the Asian Cricket Committee, free from ICC control, and started the Asia Cup in 1984 to showcase tournament hosting capabilities. Lacking funds to host a World Cup, though, Salvi recruited India's Ambani with government help. Salv then proposed India and Pakistan co-host the 1987 World Cup. England objected furiously, insisting only they had the infrastructure and experience. However, Salv introduced a rotational hosting policy that passed by vote. India and Pakistan hosted the 1987 event successfully, though BCCI did not profit. But in 1991, BCCI discovered a golden goose, selling Indian cricket television rights. With India's market opening to foreign investment, companies coveted advertising to cricket's huge viewership. In 1993, BCCI began selling Indian tour broadcast rights for large sums. Doordarshan, which previously charged BCCI to show matches, now paid BCCI $54 million for a five-year deal. Quickly, BCCI became cricket's richest board through leveraging India's passion for the sport. After becoming financially dominant, BCCI's motives shifted. In 1987, India took the World Cup from England out of spite over past slights. 
but in 1996, a broadcaster offered BCCI $14 million for hosting rights. Disregarding their previous grudge, BCCI outbid England with more guaranteed money to NAB 1996 World Cup hosting. Money now drove BCCI, not morals. With Asian cricket rising, BCCI Administrator Jagmohan Dalmaya recognised the ICC needed an Asian chairman. The MCC president had always assumed that ICC post as a British stronghold. But elections commenced, and West Indies' Clyde Walcott became the first non-Brit chairman, though still England aligned. In 1997, Dalmia ran for chairman knowing full member votes would favour England's preference. Instead, Dalmia catered to associate members, buying them flights and hotels to attend the London election. Grateful for Dalmia's generosity, the associates backed him, granting India control of the ICC. There's pride in an Indian ICC chairman outmanoeuvring the British establishment. Yet in reality, BCCI's ruthless financial priorities have damaged cricket globally since wresting control from the more judicious English governance. Cricket was better controlled by Britishers because Indians have destroyed it. In the 2001 India-South Africa series, the match referee suspended four Indian players for one test and fined their captain Ganguly. Most controversially, star Sachin Tendulkar was alleged to have tampered with the ball. An uproar ensued in India, claiming Tendulkar merely cleaned the ball. Many kept silent, but some spoke out against excuses made for Tendulkar. The BCCI furiously rejected the charges and bans. Despite ICC backing the referee, South Africa acquiesced to India's demand to bar him from officiating the next match. South Africa complied in return for India honouring their lucrative broadcast rights contract. The teams played the third test without ICC approval, rendering it unofficial. This marked the onset of BCCI leveraging its financial might to bully cricketing boards for favourable outcomes. The BCI warned South Africa of forfeiting large sums if they stood by match officials over India's desires. South Africa's government directed its players to play the unofficial test under India's conditions. The rise of the extremely lucrative Indian Premier League granted BCCI unchecked power over world cricket. As the richest league with rights valued at over $15 billion, the IPL completely altered cricket's landscape in India's favour. Fearful of BCCI retaliation, no other board risks allowing its players to play overseas leagues and jeopardise their IPL participation. BCCI's money muscle now forces the cricketing world to bend to India's wishes. BCCI prohibits Indian stars with global popularity like Dhoni and Kohli from playing in overseas leagues. BCCI knows these players attract Indian viewership that grows rival leagues' value and influence, diluting BCCI's power. Boards are too financially dependent on India tours to defy BCCI's orders. In 2012, an ICC-commissioned governance report suggested reforms. ICC shouldn't favour members over global growth, address imbalanced power leaning toward India, increase funding to associates. BCCI rejected it entirely. When the ICC players' representatives supported these recommendations, BCCI backed an opposing candidate and warned voters of forfeiting India tours for non-support. Their candidate won. Ex-ICC CEO Haroon Logat's disagreements with BCI led to his premature exit. When South Africa appointed Logat, BCCI cut their tour causing huge losses. Then, in 2014, BCCI gave green light to a proposal allying with England and Australia as the Big Three. They awarded themselves the lion's share of ICC revenue when previously distributed equally, taking advantage of India's media rights value. Now with England and Australia also on board, no checks remain on BCCI's power to direct cricket governance towards self-interest rather than global good. The ICC has only 12 full members and around 100 associate members that remain critically underfunded. The BCCI stands to earn approximately $230 million per year between 2024 to 2027, according to the ICC's projected earnings distribution a staggering 38.5% share of the ICC's total annual revenue. This completely dwarfs even their fellow Big Three allies in England and Australia, who would receive only 6.89% and 6.25% respectively. 
No other cricket board comes close to matching the BCCI's figures. The next highest, Pakistan, would gain less than 6% annually. Overall, the ICC's full members, heavily tilted toward the Big Three, obtain almost 89% of the $600 million pool. This leaves only 11% to be divided among associate and affiliate members seeking to globally expand cricket. The numbers paint a bleak picture about where true power lies in cricket's governance and priority toward its improvement worldwide versus maximizing Indian profitability. For example, in 2008, the Chinese Cricket Board received just $30,000 to promote the sport in the nation of 1.5 billion people, an impossible task. Even full members face weakening support. India has monopolized matches against elite opposition in the ICC's latest Future Tours program. Over the next five years, India is slotted to play top teams extensively while only facing Minos Zimbabwe and Ireland three and two times each. This compounds struggling sides' issues. Once mighty West Indies, two-time world champions now only get a couple test series against tough teams amidst a steady diet of lesser sides. Their cricket board has gone bankrupt. Without adequate funding or competitive matches, how can teams like West Indies maintain strength? The pattern continues downhill. Despite effectively running the ICC, the BCCI has actively shrunk rather than grown cricket. The 2007 World Cup featured 16 teams, yet the 2023 tournament has just 10 nations after India embarrassingly exited early in 2007, playing only three games. Broadcasters lost projected revenue from more potential India matches. So, for 2023, BCCI ensured formats guaranteeing India nine games, prioritizing their own wealth over global participation. Contrast this with Afghanistan, where cricket mania has uplifted a traumatized people. The national team comprised refugees, achieving the dream of playing the 2015 World Cup. Their rise demonstrated cricket's tremendous potential before BCCI assumed stranglehold command. Further, BCCI's successful push for expanded IPL windows, squeezing all other cricket signifies a brazen ambition to kill international cricket as we know it to maximize short-term profits. At the root lies the question, who controls Indian cricket? Disturbingly, governance stays in the hands of politicians and corporate businessmen from influential Indian families rather than former players invested in the sports nurturing. All state association heads are relatives of ministers, MPs and BCCI office bearers like Jay Shah, current BCCI secretary, as well as son of Home Minister Amit Shah. They crave retaining power and wealth above stewarding cricket's sustained global improvement. In the end, are those currently ruling BCCI willing to destroy this beloved centuries-old sport in service of their financial priorities? The extended actions sadly suggest so.